every year in Great Britain, nearly 8,000 old age pensioners freeze to death or die of hypothermia because they cannot afford the power that will give them heating through the winter months. If it emerges that we have had access to a free source of power for more than 70 years, how would we feel, I wonder, if we were to discover that that technology has been sat on and in whose interest? Who David Grush is in terms of his position within the intelligence community is absolutely key to why this story is so important. We're talking about UFOs, we're talking about ET technology. But what David Grush has added to the story is we're not just talking about bits and pieces of metamaterials, we're talking about entire craft and we're talking about pilots. Before we get into today's content, on behalf of the Fifth Kind TV, I want to say a big thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring today's content. Surfshark is a VPN that allows us all to become citizens of the world through online access. If you're like me, you'll enjoy watching online content from countries all around the world. But I live in Australia, and what I'm shown in internet searches will be different to what you're shown in Canada, America, the Philippines, Germany, the Netherlands, wherever you're watching from. By using Surfshark, I'm able to access a world of online content and see all the things that you see and many other things beside. Surfshark enables us to become citizens of the world through online availability. Get fully protected. Follow the link in the description Sign up and use the promo code FIFTHKIND to receive an 85% discount. Plus, you'll get three months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you try it and you don't like it, you can easily cancel your subscription and receive a full refund. With Surfshark, you can swim under the radar in the sea of online content. In his capacity as lead investigator for the UAP task force in the Pentagon, David Grush was working at the highest levels of US intelligence. Since the Pentagon's admission in 2019 that for more than 70 years it had been maintaining a program to analyze materials from UFO crash retrievals, it was only logical, essential no less, for David Grush to be allowed access to the program. This is the name given to the work of top secret military intelligence units devoted to reverse engineering materials from UFO crash retrievals. As lead investigator, David Grush's remit was Transmedium Anomaly, which is today's military intelligence nomenclature for UFOs. Since July 2022, the Pentagon's unit for studying UFOs has become the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office or ARROW for short. The name clarifies that the unit isn't focused purely on things which fly in the sky and which can't be explained. All domain indicates in the air and under the water. Craft filmed flying through the air and then entering the ocean water is what all domain is all about. A craft that can do that is called transmedium Gaining access to the intelligence community's information about those was David Grush's remit. David Grush's remit was not to have eyes on the technology that had been gathered by the program, but rather to assess the significance and importance of that material and of the eyewitnesses involved. It was his progress in garnering that information which he found blocked by other units within the world of military intelligence. I think what we're seeing now is a real acceleration of disclosure, but there's quite a background to what's happening in Washington in 2023. And I think it's interesting to go back to the beginning of the 21st century to see a shift in how government authorities approach the question of UAPs or what we used to call UFOs. Early in the 21st century, 
we saw the beginning of a movement for disclosure that interestingly was staffed by people who previously had been employed by government and military units devoted to analyzing UFO sightings. So that's interesting in itself. The fact that people who had signed layers and layers of non-disclosure agreements and bound by layers of official secrets laws were allowed to campaign for declassification of government UFO files was interesting. Why would they have the clearance to turn around and say all this should be made public when their job had been to look at these things in deep secret. So anyone following the topic noticed this shift at the beginning of the 21st century. And from that time to this, there has been an acceleration of declassification. And so there have been files released by governments all around the world that mean that all of a sudden there is far more credible data available to the public about the UFO phenomenon than there has been in decades. So that in itself was a shift. During that period, we had a figure like Paul Hellyer, the former Minister of Defense for Canada, claiming that in military intelligence and covert government levels, it was known while he was in office that we were in contact, that we were being visited by extraterrestrial craft. And he was allowed to say that. There were no consequences for him saying that. There was no official debunking of him. He was allowed to make those statements. And that was something new. Why do you say that UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying over our head? Well, because I know that they are. And they've been, um, as a matter of fact, um, they've been visiting our planet for thousands of years. During the Cold War, 1961, there were about 50 UFOs in formation flying south from Russia to the, across Europe. And the uh, Supreme Allied Commander was very concerned um, and about ready to press the panic button when they turned around and went back over the North Pole. So they decided to do an investigation and they investigated for three years and they decided that um, with absolute certainty that four species, four different species, at least, had been visiting this planet for thousands of years. And then in 2008, Dmitry Medvedev, who at the time was the Prime Minister for Russia, on a live microphone, said that each successive Prime Minister of Russia is given a dossier detailing the spacefaring civilizations with whom we are already in contact. And again, there was no debunking. Uh, President Putin didn't go on camera and say, I have to distance myself from my prime minister's remarks, or those are his private opinions. It was no kind of statement like that. It was just left hanging for people to notice. <laughs> Рассказываю вам первый и последний раз. Вместе с передачей чемодана с ядерными кодами президенту страны приносят специальную папку. На ней написано совершенно секретно. И она целиком и полностью посвящена пришельцам, которые посетили нашу планету. Одновременно предоставляется доклад от абсолютно закрытой спецслужбы которая занимается контролем пришельцев на территории нашей страны. Значит, две эти папки передаются вместе с ядерным чемоданом. The same period we had the fascinating case of Gary McKinnon. Gary McKinnon, working on his own, had managed to hack NASA computers and evince data with images and text suggesting there was some kind of collaboration already going on between US military intelligence and an extraterrestrial faction. What was so curious about that is how publicly this was dealt with. The USA wanted to extradite Gary McKinnon and put him in prison for the rest of his life. And Parliament in Westminster in Great Britain said, no, that's not going to happen. And in fact, an amendment was passed to change the law, altering 
Britain's relationship with the United States of America in terms of extraditions in order to protect Gary McKinnon. And so we had the spectacle of Parliament in Westminster discussing Gary McKinnon and his fines, although they never really probed into the implications of these evidences towards collaboration. But there it was in the public domain for all to see. So this was something quite different from what we were seeing in the 20th century as the official policy around the UFO phenomenon was silence and denial. So it's quite a shift. But the real acceleration came in 2017 when the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush, Chris Mellon, released the footage of the encounter between the USS Nimitz and its aircraft and Tic Tac shaped craft. And that footage has now been viewed by people all around the world. We've seen those craft, we've seen how they move, and we understand what the unit's chief, David Fravor, means when he talks about the technological capabilities of those craft being well beyond anything terrestrial technology can explain. Now, that was framed as a leak. We now know it was an official leak that Chris Mellon had a clearance to release that. There were no repercussions upon him for doing that. And it was a kind of testing of the waters to test the public response. There was no blind panic. And so after a two years testing period, the Pentagon steps forward, comes clean and says, yes, we authenticate that footage. That encounter really did happen. And in fact, we have had a unit investigating these encounters and examining physical materials retrieved from UAP crashes for more than 70 years. And we heard from Lou Elizondo, who had headed up that unit for 10 years. Now at that point, people were really not quite sure what to make of this. It was such a vault fast from decades long policies of silence, no comment or debunking to saying, well, actually, Yes, there are UFOs, and yes, some have crashed, and yes, we have materials, and yes, we've been examining them for 70 years plus. Now, what was interesting about that time frame is that it threw a different light on a very old urban legend during the rounds, and that was to do with President Eisenhower who in 1954 was on a golfing holiday in Palm Springs, and in the middle of the night, he's whisked away to some meeting. Now this was witnessed, and there was a press release made saying that the president had died. And then only minutes later, the official story comes out, which is, oh no, it was emergency dental care. He had problem with a crown that needed fixing in the middle of the night of his golfing holiday. And that's the official story from that time to this. And yet, from that time to this, there's been another explanation that President Eisenhower was involved in conversations in which USA government at a covert level had to decide what to do with contact with pilots of craft who were visiting us at this time and essentially decide with which faction of visitors we would ally ourselves. Now, there was no real corroboration of this story for a very long time until the Pentagon acknowledged it had been examining crash retrievals for more than 70 years. And then in 2020, Haim Ashed, the Brigadier General, who for 28 years was Israel's Chief of Space Security. So it was his job to know if we were in contact he stepped forward and said that on the basis of his privileged information, his understanding is that we have been in contact at a covert government level for more than 70 years and that we have been involved in technology sharing and collaborations and research projects here and on the surface of Mars. So this was a very far reaching statement, which we might have just shrugged off were it not for who it was saying this, there could hardly be somebody more credible than Brigadier General Hem Ashed. As I say, it was his job to know if we were in contact, being Israel's Chief of Space Security. 
if what he is saying is true, that the program, as it's known, has been on for more than 70 years, that takes us back to the time frame of Eisenhower's administration and supports the idea that he was on the inside of the collaborations that Haim Shed is now speaking about and that are now hinted at by the claims of David Grush in Washington. The program is the Pentagon's name for the program of reverse engineering materials retrieved from UFO crashes. Now, after 2019, when the Pentagon admitted to having this unit in place, there was corroboration of those stories because some people listened to Lou Elizondo and said, I just don't know what to make of this. Because here's someone who was employed by the government. Is this just a government story that we're hearing? And with what agenda? Is it true that we have physical materials from UFO crashes? Because that's earth shattering if that's the case. Well, it wasn't just left to Lou Elizondo to say it was so, because we then heard from the former chief of French intelligence, Alain Juillet, who said publicly that he was there at the launch of the current iteration of that unit and that yes, indeed, it existed to examine metamaterials from UFO crashes. We then heard from the very eminent physicist Jacques Vallée, who said yes, He's one of the scientists involved in examining those metamaterials. And we heard from the American physicist, Eric W. Davis, whose job is to examine those materials and then brief the Pentagon's unit on the implications of what has been found. So all that was in the public domain before David Grush stepped forward. Eric Davis had spoken publicly about the fact that we were examining materials from off-world vehicles not made on this Earth, which can't get more explicit. We're talking about UFOs, we're talking about ET technology. But what David Grush has added to the story is we're not just talking about bits and pieces of metamaterials, we're talking about entire craft, and we're talking about pilots. So again, we're into the territory of contact, conversation, and possible collaboration. This group over here doesn't share its intelligence with this group over here. How likely is it then that they would want to share it with an investigator from this group over here? How likely is it they would want to share it with Congress? Not very likely because the culture is of independence and subsidiarity. We don't share intelligence. The job of these units is to discover secrets and then keep secrets. So it's a bit of a culture shift when Congress comes along following conversations in the Senate in uh, 2021 and then in Congress in 2022. Congress wants to know what's going on, what's the truth of this program. David Grush has his remit and then it's blocked. So now we have a situation where members of Congress are saying, if there is a national security threat to the United States of America, Congress should be allowed to know. If there is an existential threat upon the USA and indeed the rest of the world, Congress must be allowed to know by what authority can these intelligence agencies withhold information like that. Now, where I grew up in Great Britain, the intelligence agencies believe they're not accountable to Parliament. They're not democratically accountable because they derive their authority from the Crown. So what they know is none of the Prime Minister's business. It's none of Parliament's business. And that's what they would claim as their constitutional footing. Well, what's the constitutional footing in the USA of the intelligence community withholding earth-shattering information from Congress? The answer is that there are laws which have created layers of top secret information to which members of Congress do not have automatic access. These laws began in 1947 when President Truman signed the National Security Act into being. It laid the foundations of what was to become the CIA. And from that time to this, I think the apparatus has been there for the intelligence community to keep secrets even from Congress. But if we are talking about 
information about whether or not the universe is populated, whether or not we are in contact, whether or not we have technology from the program, isn't that more important than a culture of independence and subsidiarity within the intelligence community? Isn't that information that belongs to all of us? And that's the question now being wrestled with by Congress in Washington. It's entirely possible that this policy of non-disclosure has not been the choice of the USA or of covert government or intelligence communities around the world. It's very possible that it was decided by our visitors. And in fact, that was the claim of Professor Brigadier General Haim Ashed. He said that our visitors have chosen not to self-disclose until you and I, the general public, have a better understanding of what space is and what spaceships are. That actually implies two layers of permission that need to be given for disclosure. Apparently our visitors are waiting until the public are brought into the picture. Well, it's surely up to our governments and intelligence communities to bring us into the picture. If they know what spaceships are from their 70 years of research on the craft to which we have access, why not tell the public? This question of disclosure isn't just information. Oh, we have neighbors. Oh, we've been in contact. What technology do we have access to? If we just stay on that topic for a moment, this was one of the things that really motivated Gary McKinnon because every year in Great Britain, nearly 8,000 old age pensioners freeze to death or die of hypothermia because they cannot afford the power that will give them heating through the winter months. If it emerges that we have had access to a free source of power for more than 70 years, isn't that scandalous? That was Gary McKinnon's argument, and it was something that really exercised the Apollo astronaut Ed Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon. He argued that if we have access to free energy, it would change so much about the economics and geopolitics of planet Earth. It would be a huge leap forward. How would we feel, I wonder, if we were to discover that that technology has been sat on and in whose interest? And that's the other question about contact. If we've been in contact for more than 70 years, in whose interests has that been kept quiet? Who represents us in these conversations? And in whose interests are decisions being made? I'm old fashioned, I have an old fashioned faith and hope in democracy. And I believe that transparency would only advance our conversation as a species with our neighbors. And that was certainly the view of Ed Mitchell, who campaigned tirelessly for the American government to come clean about being in contact. Now, there's another person bound by layers of non-disclosure agreements and official secrets laws, and yet he was allowed to campaign for the US government to declassify UFO files and to make a statement about being in contact. He was making clear what he believed was the case. When I was at school, I think the feeling was that if ever there was a public admission of government authorities that the universe is populated and that we've been in contact and that we have visitors, there would be blind panic, like in War of the Worlds. Well, that has proven to be not the case because the information that we're in a populated universe has now been out there, well and truly confirmed, ratified by the Pentagon since 2019. There's not been a blind panic. And recent polling in the USA says that around 67% of the population, if you were to tell them we're in contact, we've been in contact for 70 years, would say, well, I'm not surprised. I'd more or less work that out. So we're really not looking at a scenario of blind panic. In my Eden series books, I show that in the past, our ancestors spoke more openly about extraterrestrial contact. And the elders of ancient cultures entrusted the public with that knowledge. 
if those were the beliefs and worldview of our ancestors, are we not able in the present to deal with the same information? Some would ask, why hasn't there been blind panic given that there has really been a public affirmation by senior figures, by the Pentagon, that we are in contact, that there are UFO craft, that we have some materials, that there's been contact with pilots, whom David Grush refers to as non-human biologics, and I'll come back to that phrase in a minute. Why hasn't there been a blind panic? I think it's because we are oversaturated with information, we're, with not all of which is credible. We are oversaturated with entertainment, and confidence and trust in government is so low that people just don't know what to believe. And people have said to me, well, I don't know if I trust David Grush because he was employed by the government. And if he was employed by the government, then he's probably a shill. He's just pushing forward some official misinformation. But I think that would be a mistake because what's happening now is embarrassing. It's embarrassing to Congress. It's embarrassing to the Pentagon. It's embarrassing to the intelligence community. I can't see that there's any real benefit to the powers that be of this current impasse between the Pentagon and Congress. And I don't think it's logical to say that because someone has worked for the government, they must be a shill. I think to dismiss David Grush as a shill is a mistake. He is actually taking a great risk in being the front man for this constitutional challenge. He has already faced reprisals. The Intercept published this article about his medical history, the fact that he suffered from PTSD, the fact that he self-medicated for it, as if that was at all relevant to what was going on, because it is about the legality of one arm of government being denied information by another arm of government. It's got nothing to do with David Grush's PTSD. But the fact that he's had that pushback, I think shows you he's not doing this for his own benefit. He's being incredibly courageous. And before he made this official complaint, which the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community found to be credible and urgent, he had sat down with the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community and asked for a clearance to do an interview with the Australian journalist Ross Coulthard to bring all this to public attention. And I really must applaud my fellow countryman Ross Coulthard for doing that interview with David Grush, pushing the conversation forward in a way that led to the hearing on July the 26th with the Congress Oversight Subcommittee. And if you haven't watched that, you should watch the whole thing. When somebody who has been employed by the government, who has signed layers of non-disclosure agreements, bound by layers of official secrets laws, when somebody like that steps forward and starts speaking, instead of saying, oh, they're a shill, I think you should listen very carefully to what they're saying because there will be so much that they are not allowed to say that what they do say becomes even more significant. So every time in that hearing on July the 26th that David Grush said, I can't answer that publicly, that would have to be in a closed session, I can answer that in a skiff, you have to realize that the question that preceded that statement is being validated. He is saying there is something to see here, which is under wraps. And it's the under wraps aspect of it that is so interesting. Members of Congress want to know, are we in contact? Is there technology sharing? Are there communications going on? Is there collaboration going on? And what exactly does David Grush mean by non-human biologics? I mean, he's not talking about moss on a damp portion of Mars, or a bit of ice on a cold corner of the moon. He's talking about pilots. Are they alive? Are we in conversation? Are we in collaboration? That's what members of Congress would like to know, and that's what I think a growing number of the public is also wanting to know. 
by what right is information like that withheld from the public and in whose interests? After more than 70 years of research, these units within the intelligence community must have some idea of what space is and what spaceships are. And if that's the case, then it's high time that you and I are brought into the picture. My work in this field has been the study of ancient texts and indigenous narratives around the world. And in the root meaning of key words in narratives from all around the world, I find the evidence that our ancestors had contact in the deep past. So for me, it's only logical that if the universe was populated in the past, it's populated in the present. That if there was contact in the past, there's probably contact today. And in the time that I've been publishing my books, Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden, Echoes of Eden, The Eden Conspiracy, people have contacted me with very credible information regarding the program. I would love to hear what the Pentagon knows. I would love to hear what conversations have been going on. If there's a possibility that we can have a better human experience equipped with better technology, free energy, whatever it is, better understanding of space and spacecraft, whatever it is, then I think that right belongs to humanity as a whole and not individual units within the US intelligence community. And that's really the question that's being struggled with in 2023 in the halls of power in Washington. And so I'm watching with great interest to see what happens next. If you enjoy our content here on Fifth Kind TV and would like to support our work, please would you consider subscribing to our new website, fifthkind.tv. Here we will have our full catalogue of material along with exclusive access to interviews and documentary content. Sign up today, become part of the community, become part of the conversation. Thank you so much for your support and I'll see you there.